Lewis Reddick joining us from Columbus, Ohio, ESPN Monday Night Football analyst, the pro day of Justin Fields. Lewis, thanks for joining us. Have you ever seen a bad pro day? Um, no, not really. I mean, I've seen I've seen ones where Dan, you know, maybe the players didn't, especially at quarterback, didn't perform maybe up to expectations as far as some of their accuracy is concerned. I think I believe Teddy Bridgewater's pro day was one where people thought it should be better than what it actually was. But look, I, I think look, th- this is just, these are the kind of things that at this time of year, absent actual real life games being played that a lot of importance is being attached to as far as how guys look in these, in these environments. And we know better, we know better than to put too much into it, but <laughs> it's because we love this sport so much. We'll blow up anything, man. And these are, and these are fun. And it, it, it is. And I think in this environment in particular, Dan, where people haven't seen each other in a long time, they, they just want to like they want to be around people. They want to see these guys throw, and and Justin Fields will put on a show today. What do you want to see out of a quarterback? I think first and foremost, look, you you want to see, especially if he had mechanics deficiencies, whether it be with his with his feet, with his release, with the length of his release. You want to see that kind of stuff get cleaned up here, and you want to see him be able to repeated over and over and over again in the proper new and improved way if he had issues in that way. And I think you, obviously you want to see ball placement. You want to see accuracy. You want to see velocity. Those are the things you want to see. And, and, and if that's what you're looking for in particular today, Justin Fields has that in droves. I mean, this guy can throw the football as good as not better than any other quarterback in this draft. But what's the will, issue, though? Want, you know what? I, I think with it, with him, it's this. You know, I think a lot of times when quarterbacks come out of Ohio State, people have such respect for Ryan Day, and they believe that he is such a masterful play caller and play designer. They want to know how much of it is Justin, how much of it is Ryan, how much is Justin really artic- You know, how much is he orchestrating at the line of scrimmage as opposed to how much of it is Ryan Day? And people want to ask. They want to know questions about. They want to have answers rather to what happened against Northwestern, what happened against Indiana. Is that indicative of a bigger problem or, or were those just bad days? I spent a lot of time talking to Brian Day already this morning and he answered those questions. He said, look, every quarterback's going to have a bad day. I mean, and the, the play the play against Indiana, like he said, Justin was trying to win the Heisman Trophy in that one game and he was trying too hard. And, you know, and he's a human being. He's still a young quarterback. So if people want to you know, knock him down because of it, then you're going to be missing out on what is really a very unique, uniquely talented individual. And I think we'll see that today. How many of these quarterbacks do you think can start right away? You know, I, I never want to say that any of them can really start right away. Can they? I guess they all can. Should they? I guess is the better question, right, Dan? Should they? Should any of them start right away? I think, obviously, I think, you know, the, the arrows point towards Mac Jones being the one who can start right away because he's considered maybe the most cerebral in terms of how much responsibility Steve Sarkeesian and Nick Saban gave him in the huddle at the line of scrimmage. And because and the reason why they did that is to, is to make up for some of the athletic limitations that he had as far as not being able to create when things broke down. Mac had to play within the context of that offense, and he did it beautifully. So I think he's probably the one who people think should be able to play right away at a high level or at a reasonably high level. But I would not discount any of these other young men because they are all very talented and all very smart. But it's it's we have these one year wonders now, and I don't know mm-hmm. how difficult it is. You know, you're a former executive. You you're looking at you know Dwayne Haskins one year wonder, uh, sure. Kyler Murray one year wonder. You're just not quite sure what you're getting there. Zach Wilson was competing to start at BYU, and here mm-hmm. he is going to be the second pick overall. Like it's just it's I don't know how you do enough research where you go, yep. Yep, that guy is real. He's legit here. Uh, You know, Joe Burrow, if he had come out his junior year, he's a fourth-round draft pick. He stays and has the greatest single season a quarterback's ever had, and he's the number one pick overall. Mac Jones, we didn't even know who he was. He wasn't on anybody's (laughs) list. Now he could be the third pick overall. That's That's right. That's a crazy ascension with some of these quarterbacks. Yeah, you know what? I mean, obviously a lot of it, I mean, as you know, Dan, is, is supply and demand. I mean, you just you have such limited supply of quarterbacks every year, and the demand is so great to find that next one that can lead your team to the promised land. But I think getting back to how do you know, you really don't know, okay? And any, any scout or GM who tells you that they do know, for, you know with certainty that this guy's going to be great and this guy's not, 
they're lying. And, and look, all, all GMs and scouts want to believe that they invented football and they can tell things that someone else can't. But really what it comes down to more than anything is what are the teams doing to help these players succeed as far as teaching progressions, play calling, surrounding cast. I know people don't want to hear that because people just want to know that this want to believe that their GM smarter than the next guy. But really where the GM is going to really set himself up to succeed is what is he doing sur- as far as surrounding this young man and what is the coaching staff doing? Because I've seen it too many times as a player and I've seen it in the front office too. I've seen players get ruined because their coaching was just not up to par. And everyone believes that all, across all 32 teams, that coaching is equal and you know better. It's not. It's just not. And that doesn't, that, that's not to be disrespectful. That's just the truth. And some of these guys will be better served going some places as opposed to other places. It just fit matters for these quarterbacks. So until you can tell me all of that, I can't tell you with certainty who's going to be better than the next guy. Do you think that Zach Wilson is better than Sam Darnold? I think he's physically, you know, from a throwing perspective, he's more talented. He's naturally more talented throwing the football. Okay. And you can see that. But it's the NFL. Look, Jamarcus, who was more talented throwing the football <laughs> than Jamarcus Russell, right? Not many. And, and for this matter, look, I, I came on your show and I told you I believed that Dwayne Haskins was a phenomenal talent. And I still do. But it isn't just about how you throw the football. It's how you conduct yourself, how you study, how you commit yourself, what the coaches are like, how much are they invested in you, how much do they believe in you, what kind of play calling do they subject you to. That's really where that's where the money is made, and that's where these but, guys wind up separating themselves. But, Lewis, how do you investigate work ethic? If you're a front office executive, because yeah. that, to me, I go back to the equipment guy at Washington State was mm-hmm. telling me about Ryan Leaf. Mm-hmm. And he said he doesn't love football, you know, mm-hmm. he, and, and he turned, you know, it turned out to be true that he didn't love football. Sure. He was good at football. He just didn't love football. How do you yep. do an investigative search there to find out if somebody truly loves the game? Yeah. You know, some of it's going to be, you know, your instinctive gut feel when you have one-on-one interviews with a certain individual and you're, based off of your past experiences, does a certain guy develop? or rather exhibit the kind of behavior that you've seen other guys who are invested to that degree exhibit. Some of it's going to be word of mouth and really having to trust the kind of sources that you're talking about, whether it be the equipment guy, the grounds crew guy, the security guy who saw this guy showing up at 4.35 a.m. in the morning before anyone else did, putting in the work in the summer when everyone else was on vacation. You're going to take all of that to really try to ascertain whether or not somebody truly loves football. And, and, and then, you're never going to be 100% on it, but guys, should, I mean, just like whether it's football or anything else, Dan, I mean, people, you, you know, I mean, people who perform at a high level, who are unique in their chosen profession, exhibit unique traits and habits as far as their dedication to their craft. And you can pick out the ones who really do stand out and the ones who really do love it. And some of those guys who are on the fence Hey, I, I guess you try and stay away from them, but you're you're just trying to really you're just trying to line things up, line the dominoes up enough to where you reasonably feel that this guy's not going to bust out on you because he didn't love the game. That's all you're trying to do, and it, and it's an imperfect science, and that's why every year we have these discussions. He's Lewis Riddick, the former player, ESPN Monday Night Football analyst. All right, give me the logic behind what the Niners are doing with this draft <laughs> pick and with Jimmy G. Yeah, I think. For sure, that they they feel as though out you know other than Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson, they like their pick of Trey Lance, Justin Fields, or Mac Jones. They're comfortable with with one of those three, um, and they feel as though putting you know getting up to that number three spot, given what they gave up, puts them in a position where they're going to set themselves up for the future. With Jimmy G, look, I he's a high, 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 high priced bridge quarterback right now is what he is. He's a placeholder. It's as simple as that. And the way Kyle talked about it yesterday, look, they want him to be the placeholder. They would like for their young quarterback to not have to play right away. But if you make him an offer that he likes, he will send him to you, meaning Jimmy Garoppolo. He'll send him to you. And I think, you know, as Chris Sims has alluded to and different people have alluded to, the only way that you would really consider sending Jimmy G down the road is because you feel as though the young quarterback that you're going to draft you have a reasonable chance of getting him ready to play right now with a roster that he thinks can win a Super Bowl. 
And that's why people are connecting the dots to Mac Jones, because they feel as though he's the guy who will be ready to play the fast. It's a fascinating, fascinating puzzle to try and put together. And that's what's going to make this whole month so intriguing, because athletically, Mac knows himself he's not on the same level as Trey Lance and Justin Fields. He knows that. But he also knows this. When we talk about quarterbacks busting out of the league, Dan, it's usually because of what's going on from the neck up, isn't it? Yeah. It has nothing to do with how he performed in a pro day. Nothing to do with how he flipped his hip and threw the ball across field going against the grain. It had to do with something that just was not connecting upstairs. And Mac Jones, no one has that issue with. So is, is San Francisco really crazy for moving up to number three to pick him? I guess we'll find out. Yeah, but when did Jimmy G stop being Kyle Shanahan's type of quarterback? Because I'm assuming we keep hearing about Kyle Shanahan's type of quarterback. You sure. traded for him. You know, yep. like he, he wasn't there when you got there. You traded for him. It's like sure. Sean McVay had Jared Goff. He was mm-hmm. your quarterback. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden he's – we don't blame the coach. We always blame the player. Right. Absolutely. And you know what? I think when you're dealing with human beings – who have changing opinions and changing, you know, mindsets towards certain individuals. I think you have to be, you have to prepare yourself for, for people to basically change their minds and go in a different direction. And not, I don't know what the moment is or what, what the moment was for Kyle, where he felt like I needed to go in a different direction, but I, I think it's an accumulation of things over time that he watched. I'm sure that Super Bowl probably stings in many different ways against Kansas city where you know, he has Emmanuel Sanders streaking open in the middle of the field and Jimmy overthrows him, which really that would have won him the football game. They probably win that game if he hits that throw. But do you think you know, he's still like, the quarterback? If they win that Super Bowl, is Jimmy G... Mm-hmm. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all, No, Lewis. you know what? No, 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 no. I, I was listening to what you were saying, but I know where you were going with it. Does Do I think he's still the quarterback yeah. if they win that Super Bowl? I don't know. It's Jared Goff I, I still the know. quarterback if the Rams win the Super Bowl. Like, is it I, that tenuous? I mean, I, 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 you know what? That, that's a great question. That's a great question you just said. Is it that tenuous? I believe now in the NFL, it is that tenuous. Well, because now everything is so hyper analyzed and patience is not something that's at a premium anymore. It's just this. I mean, you saw, look what happened to Kyler Murray and Josh Rosen. In consecutive years, they took quarterbacks in the first. In consecutive years. <laughs> what, I mean, that was 20 years ago, you would have been like, that guy's getting fired. That GM's at it. But now, yeah. that, that just shows you the mindset has changed, man, and people will flip like that. How many teams are there today that you're aware of? All of From what I hear, all of them except the Rams. The Rams are the only team not there? One. Really? That's what I've heard. But no, I can't confirm that, but I know that, that I did hear that that may be the only team that's not here. Lewis, always great to talk to you. Have fun today. Safe travels, and uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, as always. That's uh, Lewis Riddick from the Mothership there, Monday Night Football and 